Hi, this is Pastor Jeff Farster of Freedom's Light Church of God. I want to invite you to an exciting prophecy conference. That is, if we're still here and the rapture hasn't happened in September. But it will be held October 23rd, 24th, and 25th at Freedom's Light Church of God in Ball Ground, Georgia. It'll be an exciting time. Guest speaker, L.A. Marzuli, Casper McLeod. And just at it, Chief Joseph Riverwind. And Bill Flynn. Come hear what God's Word says about the unprecedented times that we are living in. Hope to see you there. If not, I'll see you in the air. God bless. Pray and consider sowing a financial gift today to help keep spiritual encounters reaching the world on Fringe Radio. Simply go to the Upper Room Fellowship and Casper McLeod Ministries, the Upper Room Fellowship.org, and look for the donate button down on the right side of the page. If you would like to hear more and have Pastor Casper minister at your church, please go to the top of our page and click on Contact Us link. Welcome to another edition of Spiritual Encounter, and this is going to be part two with our guests, our special guests, Jim William Hosm. So you can um, take it again right where we left off here. And Jim, welcome back to the program. Oh, thank you for having me. So... I think we're we're talking talking about, about, we were talking about sin. Yeah. <laughs> What's we going to happen? People are still like concerned about this thing well, in September. I, you know, the, the weird combination, I'm looking in my notes because I want to get the exact quote on this one scripture. But there has to be, there's a lot of thoughts. People are saying that, you know, CERN is possibly opening up a, a dimension, a portal to a new dimension or another dimension where, um, where this demonic horde is going to cross over. And actually I say, you know what, that's, yeah, that's, that's what, it can be confirmed by Scripture, but um, there, yes, there is an indication that uh, it makes one go, hmm, when India had given uh, CERN, the CERN facility there a statue of Shiva doing her dance of destruction, or the destruction of the elements, uh, Shiva being the destroyer of worlds with the purpose of reestablishing a new world. But you can't establish a new one until you destroy the old one. So the whole principle behind that, India is trying to say that they realize that what, what CERN is doing is very compatible to Shiva, so Shiva somewhat personalizes um, what CERN is all about. So that leaves everybody going, what? You know, we were originally told that CERN was a... Uh, a super collider to try to collect dark matter. The problem with that, though, is you start doing the math and you realize that uh, none of us are going to be alive long enough for them to ever accumulate enough dark matter to ever do anything. They're wanting, supposedly, to punch a hole in space. It's one thing to create a wormhole, but it's another thing to be able to punch a hole in the fabric time of space and actually send it where you want it to go. So that is supposed to be what CERN is about. Now, some people are saying, well, you know, this is actually an attempt to time travel, uh, and again, I'm saying, you know what, guys, you're, you're all kind of beating around the bushes, but the Bible does give us a complete 100% answer of just what is going to happen with CERN. I should say, possibly. Um, so, so let's dive into that tonight with our listeners. So everyone fasten your seatbelts and we're going to really explore this. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we were talking about this, the time travel if, if Sir Richard Branson who actually nearly signed a record deal with some years back. If he's, you know, I mean, all of a sudden he was probably going to start selling tickets to go along with his vision, Galactic Enterprises, you know, letting you time travel into the past to future. Um, a lot of, you know, what's going on here seems like science fiction, but I think the fiction part is quickly evaporating. So... Um, <laughs> some of this stuff is becoming reality today. In most cases, whatever man can imagine... Um, especially if it opposes or circumvents God, Satan is right there to say, yes, yes, I'll show you how to do it. And, and the other part of this is, you know, CERN, I, I think a lot of people may not know, maybe some of them do, but I think some of our listeners on Fringe probably are aware, but um, just for those that may not know, CERN is also 
the birthplace of the World Wide Web. This, these are the guys that put that together so they can transport you know, messages to each other instantaneously. And um, I'm thinking maybe there could be a possible connection here with the ancient Tower of Babel, which was once the power base that you know, connected the world with King Nimrod, who was you know, a, a, a certainly an evil being, everything we know about him. Um, the, what, what are your thoughts about that? Um, how that might play into all this end time scenario? Well, here's another interesting thing about CERN, the location of CERN. CERN, uh, during the time of the Roman Empire and Roman occupation of that area, uh, was where the temple for Apollyon, or Apollos. That's right, yes. Julius Caesar between, was 45 and 50 BC. Yeah, so there's another interesting connection that makes you go, hmm. Uh, you know, <laughs> we're beginning to understand that there is a electromagnetic grid that is around the Earth. There's certain intersecting uh, points uh, by utilizing what's known as sacred geometry that all the temples um, <clears throat> in the Roman and mm-hmm. in the Greek, even the Egyptians, whenever they set their temples or anything up, they, it seems to be on these different what they call the ley lines where they're intersecting. Um, pyramids seem to all be found, you know, uh, right on them or near them. Uh, all of the temples, a uh, shaman uh, in South America would set up the same principle for their hut, for their going on their vision quest. Um, there's a consistency with that throughout the whole world in every culture. A medicine man in North America, the same thing. Um, a witch doctor in Africa. They would all set their huts in certain specific locations and usually in the center of whatever they wanted to control so that they would believe that through their various applications of altered consciousness, <clears throat> excuse me, that um, that they would be able to manipulate things from the etherical world into the physical realm. Um, that is what literally is going to happen under the right conditions, I believe. Now, and those say- conditions seem like they are certainly shaping up. I mean, this goes along with sort of Relations nine eleven. Right, where it says, right. and they had a king over them, mm-hmm. which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew tongue was Abaddon, and Greek tongue, his name was Abelon. Yep. Um, um, the- and just, just prior to that, um, Casper, there's um, a mention uh, that, the, that there's an angel that is given a key, and it, that angel opens up the bottomless pit, and out comes smoke. Uh, and then, of course, then you have your locust evasion. And boy, later on down the road, I want to get to specifics on the locust invasion because it's a it's a mind blower. Um, right. Well, I mean, again, you know, the, the scientist that was the head director of research, right, for CERN, is, mm-hmm. is said on record, out of this door might come something, or we might send something through it, which means to me they probably have already done that. Um, yeah, it would make you wonder. Um, I mean, you wouldn't make a statement like that unless you knew that was a certain well, I think possibility. No, know that it, something is going to happen, but I think the reason they keep continually try and try and try, they haven't supposedly gotten enough energy behind it to actually generate enough that they feel needs to open a, a portal. Um, I think they've been playing around with it, but there's one biblical significance that they're missing. And... I hate, you know, Pastor, i got to tell you, I've, I've wondered, should I be proclaiming this, Lord? Because, I mean, I could be the one spilling the beans to them to tip them off how to do it. But mm. then I realize, you know what? It doesn't matter. You know why? I read in my Bible. It's already going to happen. So whether I do or someone else does, it's, they're going to know. They're going to know how to do it, and it's, it's going to happen. So I... I kind of put myself at rest on that. Um, it was through prayer. I'd say, saying, Lord, I don't want to make a mistake here. I don't want to end up being a, uh, a pawn for the enemy. And he says, no, don't worry about it. Um, people need to know. They need to know the truth. So well, Jesus said, know the truth, and the truth would make you free. I mean, it doesn't say set you free. It says make you free, right? And uh, going back to the Masoretic text. And- well, you know, as we're looking, as we're looking from a biblical text and biblical perspective for um, – something coming out of a pit. You know, they, in their secular minds, are saying, oh, well, we're not really, you know, nothing from a pit. We're, we're venturing into a different dimension and bringing extra-dimensional uh, beings, you know, into our presence. And I'm sure in their minds, most of them, that's what they're thinking. They don't really believe in a literal pit or a pit of hell or anything like that. So 
So that's not even entered their mind. But as Christians, we're looking at it, we're saying, you know, they could be opening up the bottomless pit. Well, then I say, okay, guys, let's look at this further. If there's a bottomless pit, and we know that there's entities in there that have been part of a judgment from God, and they're put in there, then we got to go back into the Scriptures and find out where they were put in and what conditions put them in there. Mm. That's kind of important, wouldn't you say? I should say that would be pretty vital to the, the entire equation. Well, uh, if, we, if we go to Isaiah 24th chapter, starting at verses 20 and 22, it says, The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, and shall be removed like a cottage. Now we skip down. Um, I, I, there is some more there, but it's not pertinent really to the, the rest of the context here. So, the earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard and shall be removed like a cottage. It shall come to pass in that day, when when the earth is reeling to and fro, that the Lord shall punish the host of the high ones that are on high and the kings of the earth upon the earth. They shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in a pit, or the pit, and shall be shut up in the prison, and after many days they shall be visited. Now there's a description right there. I believe what happened right after the flood, there was an uh, axis shift. And the, the, the ones that are on high are the sons of God, and the kings of the earth are their offspring. And they're put into this pit, and they're shut up in this prison, and after many days they shall be visited. Now, it's interesting that, you know, Jesus, when he first ascended into heaven... I mean, when he first, when he died, he did not go to heaven first. He ascended into the bowels of the earth. In Ephesians 4.9, he says, now, he, now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? First Peter 3.18 and 20 says, For Christ also has once suffered for sins of the just, for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison which sometimes were disobedient when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. Now, why am I sharing that scripture in context? Because we're talking about, we're still talking in the context of the flood, but we're saying that Jesus went down and proclaimed something. Preach there doesn't mean that he was preaching the gospel. It means that he was making a proclamation. Now, the, the linchpin to all of this is, Going back to Isaiah 24, 20 and 22, it says that after many days, they're shut up in his pit. After many days, they shall be visited. Pechad, visited, is the Hebrew word, and that's a direct connection to another scripture, which is in Isaiah, and it's Isaiah 26, 13 and 4. And this, I think, is what we are being told, what Jesus said to the prison prisoners in in this pit. We're not talking as the... The Greek here, I mean, the Hebrew here is very specific. We're not talking about spirits that are, uh, or in the, yeah, the Greek for the scripture in Peter, I'm sorry. We're not talking about departed human spirits. That word used contextually there is specifically meaning disembodied spirits, the ones that were judged uh, at the flood. So we're talking about the, if you want to call them the Nephilim or the, um, the Gibor, they were the, uh, the hybrid offspring. So here's what is being said in Isaiah 26, 13 and 14, that I think Jesus made a proclamation. He said, this is, as the believers are reading and lamenting, O Lord, our God, other lords beside thee have had dominion over us. Now, the word dominion is the authority of a a husband having over her uh, bride. But by thee only will we make mention of thy name. They are dead, they shall not live. They are deceased, they shall not rise. Now, dead there literally means dead is opposite to alive. So they're dead, they're not going to, they will not live. They are deceased, the rapha, or the ghosts of the giants. They shall not rise. Now, right there, so many people have said, see, well, that proves you're wrong. Um, they're, not, they're dead and they're not going to rise. Um, no, because the very next verse overturns. This was a rhetorical statement saying that this is your natural condition. You're dead. You're not going to be alive. You're, you're the refah. You're not going to have a resurrection. You're not going to rise. Therefore, 
hast thou, meaning Jesus, visited and destroyed them and made all their memory to perish. Visited, the same word that's used in Isaiah uh, 24th chapter, pechad. The interesting thing about pechad is that that word is used when the angel visited Sarah and allowed her to have a baby way past her natural course of events. So this word is used to show us that this is the Lord intervening into the natural condition that they're dead, they're not going to be alive, that they are the ghosts of the giants, they're not going to rise. Therefore, thou hast visited them. In other words, overturned that condition, and then he's going to basically say, and destroyed them and made all their memory to perish. What is happening is he's announcing, I'm going to let you rise, but it's going to be to your total destruction and damnation. Mm -hmm. So this is what's happening. But the condition that needed to be there was the earth had to rotate on its axis. If you can imagine a key going into a cylindrical lock, it goes in one axis, something has to turn to bring the two together. The two axes are now opened, and now something comes together. So we have to have two axes that are involved here, not just one. So they're not, it's not like they're punching a hole into anything um, there. They have to... We have to find two axes. The Bible describes that there's four corners of the earth. In context to the four corners, it's always been in conjunction with a, a gateway or a holding back something um, from coming. And I'm looking through my notes to try to find the particular scriptures, and I don't think I'm going to find it. I, I had a crazy day today, and I was... No worries. Other. <laughs> It just sort of reminds me of, um, like in Ezekiel 9, it, it, it talks about the Lord, um, it, it's the, the man in linen shows up. I was talking to my friend uh, Ross Peraltu, who's probably the foremost um, person on, on, with the Shroud Encounter today, and um, I just did a presentation with him this past weekend, and we were talking about this, and it appears that it says six men, but we think these are. This is talking about angelic beings, and, and the, the man in linen being the same man that's in the shroud of Turin. Um, whenever he shows up here in, in Daniel and in Ezekiel, he's coming with judgment, and he's got a writer's um, called an inkhorn by his side. He goes in, and the glory of God's with him, and um, and it's interesting. He tells the mark. Um, in, in the foreheads of, the, of those that um, cry out for the abominations that are done in, 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 in their nation, the cities, um, mark them the, the, as, as a mark of protection, like he did with the, um, the Israelites when they, they put blood over the, the homes so the, the angel of death passed over. But then he's telling these, these six angelic beings to go and slay all the the old and young, all those people that would embrace the abominations, um, all, the, all the things that are going on, the atrocities. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's curious, you know, the, like even with the Supreme Court decisions um, this past summer, and it was in July, and what a significant moment that was, and, and to see um, the kind of people separating on the issue there. The ones that are embracing this as a wonderful advancement and the ones that see this as going absolutely against the, the Holy Word of God, which is established, you know, eons ago. Exactly. Well, I think, you know, if, if we can understand that, that with CERN, if it's, if it's truly the key and it's opening up the bottomless pit, we've got to decide, well, what is what literally is the bottomless pit? My claim is that the four corners of the earth, as mentioned several times in the Bible, and I don't have my notes right now to look at them or to find it. Um, yes, I do. So, so CERN is basically, uh, what they're saying is they're going to hit full power September, um, which would be now, September, I mean, it's the 23rd yeah. to 24th. Um, this kind of goes along um, with the Pope addressing the UN and the Congress and all that. Um, I mean, there's a lot of things all happen at the same well, time. So, trying to say too that uh, that a comet or uh, Sir Isaac Newton prophesied right. or the other people's calculations that um, on the 23rd an asteroid would hit. Some people have had visions that a comet would hit um, Costa Rica 
which would cause a um, tsunami that would wipe out the eastern coast, probably turn my state into the Great Lake State instead of the mm. Great Lakes. So, um, well, then you'll, you'll have, you know, um, oceanfront property, won't you? Yeah, then, well, <laughs> I may be swimming in the oceanfront property. Um, uh, what, what if, if, and it's a you know, quite a big reach, I think, but if all of these things should happen, then the comet hitting not only could cause the, that to happen, but it could cause the earthquakes, it could cause the volcanic activity at uh, Yellowstone National Park, it could trigger off all these things. But what it also could trigger off, if it hits it that hard, guess what could happen to the Earth? It could shift its axis. And that's mm-hmm. the same day that CERN is supposed to be fired up. So, well, I remember when Tom Horn was a guest one time. Um, he mentioned how when CERN had fired up, um, there was a count all around um, kind of borders, I think, Amsterdam, places like the Holland, that, that for like uh, two or three minutes they saw like uh, through a veil, like Nephilim type creatures that they described that just appeared and then disappeared again, uh, which was very curious. That there, there was a numerous reports that came in about the it. So, um, very strange stuff going on. Um, I suppose, you know, as well as people concerned about the economic collapse happening, you know, I mean, and, and of course the, the the Muslim nations, you know, expecting the, the Mahdi to appear sometime in the rather near future as well. So, yeah, a lot of things going on all at once. So, this is always a good time to get right with the Lord Jesus, Yeshua. And, you know, there's there's another missing element here, and this is one that, that I find more people are now starting to, to come around and understand this, but, you know, I've, I've proclaimed ever since 1996 when the Lord brought it to my attention. 1997, actually, I, I when I first heard this, I thought it was the most ridiculous thing in the world. I, I laughed literally on the floor. I'm mm. laughing. I'm saying this is silly. I had heard or read... Uh, a report that uh, the Nazis, the last bastion of Nazis, had escaped to a base 211 uh, at the Ar- Antarctic where they found an opening to a hollow earth. And they had been. Oh, yeah, and they, they went in with Admiral Byrd, right? Well, Admiral Byrd came later searching to see if they actually were, were there. Mm-hmm. Well, when I first heard this, I laughed. I thought it was the most ridiculous thing I ever heard. My Only days later, my son, who was only 12 then, he's. 34 now, but he was 12 years old, and he come up to me and he says, Dad, can we do a Bible study together? Because he knew that I used to geek out on my uh, computer. I had a Bible study computer program where you go back to the original language and everything, and excuse me, sometimes I would, you know, I'd study for hours, so he wanted to uh, study with me, and I thought, you know, 12 years old, you know, right at a, at a frail time in his life, and I said, heck, I want to get him encouraged to... And he was already in his father's home. How marvelous. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, it's cool. So you didn't have to go missing for that. Okay. You know, he followed up with the question. He says, can we do it on hell? <laughs> um, I kept a poker face, but I'm just looking. I'm going, geez, kid, can't you pick something more upbeat? I mean, you know, yeah. So, But I just smiled. I said, sure, son, we'll, we'll do one on hell. This was God's way of waking me up. Jim, I'm trying to show you something very serious and important here. So as we did a study on hell, I just, you know, scriptures that I had preached or looked at and, and talked for, you know, 20 years, all of a sudden they're leaping off the pages and showing me, Jim, the earth is hollow. There's holes at the poles. This is all part of God's plan. And and so I have uh, I have one series on the hollow earth that has all the scriptures step by step and, you know, cross-checked, referenced mm-hmm. uh, you can pretty well be assured that it is sound doctrine that the earth is hollow. How exactly it's hollow, I'm not an astro I mean, geophysicist, I don't know. But every indication is that there is openings, holes at the poles. Um, there's a convex and a concave earth. And actually, part of the occult mind in the sense of mirroring and then the, the cliche they always use, um, as above, so below, doesn't mean above from heaven unto earth. It means on the surface of the earth. And underneath the earth it's actually a mirror so that when we have the continents on 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 the surface the same but opposite is on the inside so that there's an america but it's in an, a reverse the western hemisphere and the eastern hemisphere of course being a mirror too the east is the west the west is the east so it's kind of confusing and i don't mean so you're to- describing a parallel universe within the, the earth well you could kind of put it that way it's not really a parallel 
Well, bingo, yes. In a sense, it is. It's a real physical one, but there's an etherical one, too. And they both got to intersect and fold together. Now, the four corners of the earth, uh, it describes in Revelations 9.14 that they would loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. Well, the same four angels are the ones that are holding back the winds of the earth. And I couldn't find the scripture reference for that right now. And I'm searching through my notes. And I don't want to get distracted for what we're doing, but... Um, it is there. You can email me, anybody that's listening to broadcast, and I'll be more than happy to show you exactly uh, book, chapter, text, and verse where you can find it. But basically, they're holding back the winds. Now, winds aren't necessarily mentioned in the Bible, except, I mean, as far as any definition. But we know that God, um, as the Bible does say, he walks, up, he rides upon a cherub, and other places says he rides upon a chariot upon the wings of the wind. The wings of the wind means more than just a bird wing with the wind causing an, uplifting, um, an upliftment action. Um, in the book of Enoch, there's a, in the 18th chapter, there's a complete description of the winds. And Enoch is saying, describing the winds, and he says you know, that it holds all things together, the planets, the orbs, uh, and it causes them to turn, causes them to be suspended. Um, it, they're t- he's talking about gravity. He's not talking about wind blowing. Right. He concludes that chapter. He says, and I saw the pathway of the angels. That, that ties right into conjunction with all of the descriptions of the clouds of the cherubs that are riding on the wings of the wind. So what he's controlling here, the four corners are four corners or four points of electromagnetic effects. One is the holes at the poles, north and south, which is a represents the a bottomless pit that is physical, but the etherical is the one that runs east and west. And so you would have to think, okay, where do we have any renowned areas where there's been electromagnetic disturbances and possibly people disappearing? We have the Devil's Triangle, and then if you put a line through the center of the Devil's Triangle, go all the way through the other side of the earth... You come out at the Dragon Sea. and now, I mean, that line isn't going through the center of the earth all the way through. It's going on the same latitude line all the way through to the other side. And there you have the etherical bottomless pit. The Lord told me, I can't prove this. So, you know, I, it, it's, it's only relative, I guess, for me in, in my understanding and relationship with the Lord. The Lord told me, when Jesus talked about a gulf fixed, that is the gulf. What represents the the opening and the endings, and it's actually in a in Job forty first chapter. They're not talking about a sea serpent. They're talking about the entire embodiment of Satan's domain, including this gulf fixed. It says that they're dangling doors or uh, revolving doors. And if you think about it, a revolving door is sometimes open and sometimes closed. And sometimes these effects on the Devil's Triangle is sometimes open, sometimes closed. This is an electromagnetic um, etherical field that all demonic activity is, is kind of linked into. Anybody that's done a deliverance, you, you know that the demonic realm can have play havoc on electronics and electricity and electromagnetics. Um, Buforia, the British version of um, Blue Book, concluded in their findings back in the 60s that UFO sightings seem to have more to do with the occult rather than um, extraterrestrials. And they base that fact on the electromagnetic anomalies that seem to happen at the same, you know, in the same times and very similar. So I think all the evidence there that we see in the natural confirms what I'm trying to say that I think the scriptures are telling us that this gulf fixed is the devil's triangle in conjunction with the uh, Dragon Sea. That's the other plane, the other axis of the etherical uh, bottomless pit. So the two have to come together in order to release what is inside the earth to the outside of the earth. I call it a dimension within. You know, I'm not, sh- I'm not a physicist, so I'm not sure how that works. But I am one who can study the Word of God and see through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit how these things pertain to what we're, we're seeing. So literally, it's opening up not anything from somewhere else other than what's coming right from inside of our own earth, the bottomless pit, the locust coming up. Um, the other thing that's uh, rather interesting to all of this, when I was looking at, 
I wanted to get a map for a PowerPoint presentation um, showing the connection between the Devil's Triangle and the Dragon Sea. And I couldn't find a good one. And then all of a sudden I saw one with the, the map of the Earth stretched out, uh, like an atlas would have it stretched out. And they had the centers markings of, the, of both triangles. And I noticed, and I go, huh, they're both on the same line. And then I, I'm, I'm looking, and I'm going, oh, no, oh, no, this can't be real. I can't be seeing what I'm actually seeing. So I went on Google Earth. The tips of both triangles are one just slightly above, one slightly below the 33.3 degree latitude line. And um, well, I there's a connection. Oh, <laughs> big time connection. Very big, yes. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. This is all surreal. So, uh, Pastor, the thing that I'm seeing in this is that the only reason it has failed may not be so much the power, but it's the timing. If the Earth goes into a uh, another axis shift like we had in 2011, which if anybody said was watching the moon that year, it was weird. It was different. And yet it wasn't really the moon. It was the Earth coming yeah. out of... Um, we should probably explain the 33 degrees, um, just in case somebody didn't catch that, is um, all part of the Freemasonry, which is connected with the Illuminati and Morphe and all the rest of that stuff. Right. My... So, uh, my late friend, uh, Dave Flynn, um, in his book, The Chronicle of the Mars and, and the Temple of Time, he describes this 33.3. And where it was brought to his attention, this is strange in itself. I think sometimes we can be individually uh, called out or marked out by the enemy. Um, now, um, Dave Flynn's brother, Mark, um, and had a computer company, and it was showed a little gray. It was kind of a tongue-in-cheek icon, but it had a little gray holding a computer chip disk. Now, the Crabwood crop circle that appeared in Canterbury, England, back in 2002 or three I'm not sure which year, um, it showed the gray alien holding a disk. Now, Mark and Dave both picked up and realized that there was an, uh, an American computer codex within the disk. They deciphered it out. And they did some math that I'm not even going to pretend to know how to do. Um, they saw definite patterns based on the, the French prime meridian. So 33.3 is the – it's the highest level that a human is able to attain in knowledge according to the occult. That's why we have the 33-degree mason, which is the it, highest level. It's interesting that uh, false religions like uh, Joseph Smith started his religion, the Mormonism, and – he was obviously involved with that and, and, and a mason and probably all his inner circle, you know, were masons and wore the special underwear. But he was trying to um, go beyond the 33 degrees, apparently. Yes, and I think maybe some have, um, which means to do that, um, do you stop becoming human? Or do you mean, does it mean that you go beyond the human ability and you've now encountered something other than human that is uh, helping you. Um, today we would call them, you know, getting technology from aliens, but the biblical would just say that these are fallen angels imparting to man for this knowledge, just as the book of Enoch, just as the, the Bible does probably what happened in the last days. It, it's interesting you were talking earlier about, you know, Jesus walking on the wind, and uh, I think you were reciting the um, scripture from Job, was it? Because um, we think about that. I mean, here the, he sends the I'm going to go up on the mountain to pray, and you guys go ahead, I'll catch up with you later. And a storm comes, so the disciples in the, you know, in the boat, and, and the, 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 all of a sudden they see this, they think it's a ghost walking, and he says, no, nah, don't, don't be afraid, it's just me. <laughs> and, it's, <laughs> and Peter's like, the only one, how is it Peter's the only one that is bold enough to, you know, to go, well, that's you, make me come to you on the water, Right. And, and the rest of the, 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 the guys in the boat are watching. He gets out of the boat, and, and, yep. and they hear a thump instead of a splash. And he's walking on water. We don't actually know how long he walked, but he did walk on water. Um, and then, you know, of course, he, he starts to doubt, and then the Lord saves him to get in the boat. And I think what, what really happened here is when, um, you know, he rebukes them, go, you know, Peter, you know, oh, you have faith, you know, why did you doubt, right? Now they're in the Immediately get in the boat, the wind sees, he stops the storm, and, and they, somehow they, they bow down, they worship him. But what, what was it that caused that? You know, I mean, it was obviously a miracle, 
But when these were Jewish guys, they knew the Old Testament script. They must have known Job nine eight. They knew Psalm. They you know he, he they recognized he alone spreads out the heavens and treads on the waves of the sea. Um, the it speaks of the Messiah calming the storm. You know, um, but I think it's in Psalm one o four. It talks about. Um, he lays beams of the upper chambers of the water. He makes the clouds of his chariot. Yep. He walks on the wings, which you said, right, of the wind. Right. Yep. Makes yep. his angels, spirits, his ministers, flame of fire. I mean, they suddenly recognize who's in the boat. This is the Messiah. Um, I just pray the people listening to our program tonight recognize that. You know, it's, it's that somebody asked me once when I was explaining about how... Uh, the Nazis developed UFOs and their technology, and they said, well, if it's occult hidden knowledge, how come you know about it? How come God told you? And I laughed, and I said, you know, <laughs> that's a pretty good question, and I do have a pretty good answer for it. But it is. It's like, okay, well, why, if it's forbidden, why would why God start telling us now? Because that information has been given to mankind, but it's been given in a sense to overturn and take away our faith that we have in the Lord. It's being used to replace faith in God and have it in such crazy things as, you know, the idea of aliens coming here to help us out. So with that understanding, God now has to let us know to put it in proper context so that we don't get fooled and tricked by what the enemy has up his sleeve. And the well, guy... The- just, you're right. The Lord, you know, he tells us too. You know, it's, it, it, God conceals a thing, but it's the honor of kings and priests to search. He wants us to go find it. Just like you know, those who seek me, you'll find me. You know, knock and the door will be open to you. Um, so, the, for whatever reason, the Lord, you know, desires it from us. The same way, I think it, it, the world they want. You know, it's kind of like show me, and then I'll believe it. Right? Right. And, and, and well, God says, believe it, and then I'll show you. I think I think many times, though, in context of the end time things, when something becomes a threat against our faith, when something is not true, uh, well, well, I should say, when maybe the physics part of it is true, and it's being dangled like a carrot before us for us to pursue a path that actually is going to oppose God in His way, um, then God's going to want us to seek answers, and it's going to mean going deeper than we've ever gone before on scriptures that in its time, was understood one way, but now has to be understood in a different way. Second Samuel, 22nd chapter, beginning at 10th verse through uh, the 14th verse. David is recounting how God had came down to heaven and vanquished his enemies. So he's singing this song under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He has no idea, I'm sure, of the exact specific words he's using and why he was using them. But God had a plan. Encrypted in that song was literally, when you go back to the um, every word in that text, it's literally telling you that he bent space, he came town through a wormhole, through a slipstream, and he's using this as a bridge, a Einstein-Rosen bridge, to come from outside of time into time. Mm. It's all there, and it's in detail. I've got it in one of my um, videos. On, uh, it's on part three. No, part Part two, I think, of a four-part series I have on time travel in the Bible. Um, but I give the complete breakdown of all the words and the variations of it. I mean, the Lord does talk about, you know, name is 3, 7, surely the Lord will do nothing, but he reveals his secret unto his servants, the prophet, right? So he's going to tell them first. And, and just what you're saying, I mean, with, with David, King David, I mean, he obviously supernaturally inspired, to, you know, like in Psalm um, I just, uh, the one where he talks about I'm poured out like water on my bones or out of joint, my heart's like wax is melted, you know, and he goes on about um, his tongue cleaving to his jaws and um, you know, the wicked have enclosed him and pierced his hands and feet. Broke not his <laughs> and, legs but pierced right, his feet. Yeah, but not, yeah, but not broken his, you know, and they cast lots for his clothes. I mean, yep. and this was written you know, hundreds of years before I mean, it, it's like, you know, what is it? it's looking like predictive programming almost. I mean, it's extraordinary how this is played out. I mean, you could, how can you possibly cause that people to do these things? Except well, you know, that there's a divine creator. Here's, here's the thing in Ecclesiastes 3, 
15. I call that my Twilight Zone scripture. It says, everything that is has already been, and everything that will be has already been, and God requires an account of that which is past. Well, the implication from that scripture is that everything's already past. God's not up in heaven contemplating what he's going to do. It's already been done. The Word of God is the complete history, recorded history of mankind from beginning to end. It's already been done. That's why Paul said we are already seated in heavenly places. Because you know what? We are. We're in a parallel altered universe. And those like that God who is totally subject and unyieldingly subject for his entire earthly life as a man, just like us, he followed the rules of the of his dimension. So he wasn't subject to the rules of this dimension. He could overrule and overturn anything, even death. So walking on the water is nothing to him because he's above this. What we are in is a goofed up, parallel, altered universe, literally like the Matrix. It's all messed up and it's going to come to an end. It's going to burn. But yet there's another one that's never going to burn. Yeah. That's what I think is uh, amazing. That in some scriptures they'll say that the world will last forever, and in others it says it's going to be destroyed. I've had people say, okay, so which is it? Well, actually it's both. One is going to burn up, and the other one is going to last forever, because the other one is real, and this is just a nightmare called sin, the result of sin. That's why we're told not to build up our treasures in this one, because it's just going it's, it's a matrix that's going to go away. It's not going to be here at all. It may disappear completely. Because it is going to end up, I, I truly believe this. See, Satan has a plan. He's deluded. He's insane. When he had the five I wills that he said in his heart in Isaiah 14 chapter, he really thinks he's going to beat God at his own game. Many Christians seem to think that you know Satan lost some kind of battle, was cast down to the earth, and so now misery loves companies. He's just going to you know um, try to bring down as many as he possibly can with him. It's far worse than that. He has a plan. He's deluded. He's insane. Ezekiel 38 or 28th chapter states that there's a fire raging within him. He thinks he's going to beat God at his own game if he does everything the same but opposite. So whatever God's going to do, he's going to extrapolate the same model in the same but opposite for his fashion. Then deluded in his own mind, he's going to stand before God at the white throne judgment and say, look, everything you did, I did the same, only in my way. So you're a God that sticks to your word, so you have to stick to your word. I deserve my own uh, universe. I deserve my own people. I deserve everything that you're going to have. I deserve my own. And here's the the trick. I don't know exactly how it's going, and, and, and this isn't some revelation God gave me, but I can just see this end game played out. Where here Satan thinks he's, you know, he's done this great work, and he's entitled to his own uh, dimension, and literally this dimension that we live in in time is a result of the fall. It is a parallel altered dimension bound by time. Satan's ultimate goal is a five point plan, which is the Pentagon, which is his symbol, but it's also the Ouroboros, which, which is the serpent with a tail in his own mouth. This is his desire to eternalize this state. So He thinks if he does everything the same and opposite of God that he's entitled to that. So the thing is, how does this current state end up? It ends up burnt up on fire. Well, who burned it up? Probably not directly God. It was him, Satan, who burned it up. God just allowed him to go that far. So guess what? He created his own eternal state. So he's entitled to it. So I can imagine the Lord saying to Satan, you know what, Satan, I got good news and bad for you. Bad news for you. You're right. You are entitled to your own universe. This is what you've done to this one, and that's what, where you stay. Welcome to the lake of fire. Depart from me, you that worketh iniquity. I never knew you. And boom, there he is with his own body. Well, you know, the, 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 we keep hearing about the new world order, and I keep telling people, yes, the, there's going to be a new world order. Lord Jesus, Yeshua is coming to put the world back in order. Yeah, and <laughs> I like that one. And he's going to take the other old one that thinks it's new, and uh, it's burned up. So it in, in the last moments of the program, as we're winding down, um, hmm? I, you know, I, I, honestly, I, I don't think I've ever in all my life have seen greater uncertainty and, and greater fear that, um, that people you know, are dealing with now. I mean... 
politics just is absolutely, you know, seems ridiculous at this point. Um, you're sitting here going, you mean that's that's the best they can do is put forth <laughs> these people? I mean, out of the billions and billions, there's, there's no... I mean, couldn't we have Reinhold Bonke instead to be president or something? You know, make him king, I don't know. But, um, uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's just like, what is going on? And, and people are just in fear. Um, you know, they're just confused. I mean, there's, I've never seen such greater confusion. And, and now, you know, with the transhumanist uh, agenda where, you know, they're talking about oh. um, changing, you know, improving on God's crea- creation. And I had a, 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 an atheist scientist telling me about, you know, how schools of fish, when, when there's too many of certain kind of fish, they, they actually will change sex. If there's too many males, some of them will become females and so on. Um, so somehow that's in, in the plan, you know. Within there's a a, um, a, a young man that um, he had a reassignment, uh, sexual reassignment in, in Canada, and, and apparently, you know, came close to winning um, beauty pageants up there. Um, so you know they're getting quite quite adapted to doing this, and it does seem to me to play in that whole Nephilim agenda, where um, changing God's creation. Yeah. You, you know, corrupting the image, uh, being made in the image of God and changing it into something else. And so, um, all we could, st- you know, get on this program, being on here on Fringe, we're talking about all the things that are going on, all the things that are wrong in this world. And, and yet the gospel of Christ brings us life and a life more abundant. And, and that causes me to, you know, to look on the inside and, you know, how my life's been transformed. And, and so that begs the question with all the evil around us um, what, what are you know what are the, the things that are going on the, um, that drives us the, 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 the temptations we have to fight against the struggles the things we've got to resist and you know I, I believe Christ is, is enough to transform each individual heart and and, um, and that's really where we I think each each person needs to look today right now you know look at your own life and your heart and and, and, and do whatever is necessary to get right with the Lord. Amen. You know, um, in Luke, uh, Jesus had said, when you see these things happen, look up and lift up. And, and Redemption draws nigh. Your redemption draws nigh. But when you look in the Greek for look up and lift up, it's, it is so awesome. I... I got teary-eyed when I first looked it up in, in the Greek, and I just, it overwhelmed me. It's so awesome. Mm. It means to look up, means to let the wind, uh, literally in the Greek, it's let the wind fill your sails. And then the other lift up, know that you're highly esteemed. Man, if that doesn't say it all there, what is the wind filling your sails? It's the Holy Spirit. What is he filling it with? The promises of God. What do you, can, what can you, see from that that you are highly esteemed. You are high, so highly esteemed that he came and died for you so that you don't have to fear the things that are coming upon you. And then my other second favorite scripture is in uh, Romans um, 8, 30, 38. For I am persuaded that neither life nor death nor things to come nor things past nor things future nor principalities nor powers nor any other creature will separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Man, if that isn't an assurance that I can take home, people Mm. don't know Christ. You have every reason to be scared to death, and I hope it scares you enough. Uh, Literally, I hope it scares the hell out of you so you run to the only one that can save you is Jesus Christ because you have a reason to be afraid. Christian, if you you are a blood-washed saint and you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you don't have anything to worry about. You're in a win-win situation. Endure until the end. Obey. If you love me, obey me. Willing to be willing. We know that all things work together for God, to them who love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. In other words, if you love God, you're called according to his purpose, meaning you are going to agree with God. You can't change yourself on your own. You can't even obey him on your own, but you have to be willing to be willing. Lord, I know this is wrong. Help me. Do whatever it takes. Get it out of my life, and God can set you free, and you can be free from it, and you'll be closer, tighter to him. You can talk to him. He talks back. You hear his voice. You clearly know what to go. You know, Casper, I think there's going to be a day and a time when just like... uh, um, 
Oh, now I'm going to pick it. I hate senior moments. Uh, <laughs> the apostle, the apostle, oh, was just away to the eunuch. Um, I'm sorry, I can't remember his name. Oh, it'll come back to you. Yeah, you, you, but the the apostle that was with part away. three. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we don't need. Um, anyways, he was literally transported by the Holy Spirit. Uh, yeah. He Now, I think in the last days, when we're going to have so much restrictions, we can believe God. If the Lord showed uh, that he walked on water and told Peter, hey, come on out, where's your faith? I think that these kinds of things supernaturally can uh, fill in the gap. And I think God is going to bring us to a faith where we can start to believe him. Desperate measures mean you know, desperate, desperate situations mean desperate measures. And where sin abounds, grace is greater. And I think that we have to really come to a place in our lives where we can expect the unexpectable. If God can make a donkey talk, he can, and, you know, he can make all kinds of things overrule the natural realm that we live in. And we may need this for survival. So many people are fearful. They want to start collecting guns, digging bunkers. Um, and, and I'm not against prepping. I think there's a certain amount if you're not. Sure. Well, Noah was a prepper. Yeah. <laughs> he sure was, wasn't he? <laughs> and God gave him clear direction on what to prep. Yeah. I mean, you know, we do things within reason, but God yeah. can supernaturally take care of you just the way he did all through the scriptures. Of, you know, took care of the Israelites supernaturally for all those years. Yep. So I guess we're just about out of time again. But um, um, before we go off to you, I did want to uh, give a special thank you to um, James Burkhart's radio station that uh, sent me a note yesterday that my song In Adoration hit number one on the SNT radio chart for well, September. Congratulations. So, That's great. So, yeah, nice about that. Um, thank you. Right, uh, all the people that are listening to that pushed it to number number one. And um, also, just uh, in case anybody's in the Atlanta area in October, um, on the 23rd, I'll be doing a uh, conference with Ali Malzuli and, and Chief Joseph Riverwind and, and his lovely wife, Laura Lynn, Dr. Laura Lynn and Bill Flynn. Um, it's the Southern Appalachian Prophecy Conference. So um, anybody in, in that area around northern Atlanta, um, be sure to come to that. I think you'll you'll be quite pleased with with what you can learn in that conference. So, Jim, tell us how people can get a hold of you. Okay, the best way is probably my email. That's um, at a witness four one. That's a w i t n e s s. The numbers four one at aol dot com. Um, I it's a, it's a morning ritual with me. I get up and and answer my mail before anything, and I take all my mail seriously. I try to answer everybody very personal and involved, backed with Scripture, or whatever the Christian questions might be. And I, I know your uh, listeners may have heard some pretty strange, bizarre stuff from me tonight, and I certainly don't mind um, being challenged as long as you're going to be polite. Or um, if you have serious questions, you want to know, Jim, well, I'm finding this hard to believe. Where's the Scriptures for this? I will spend the time to do it and get you everything that I possibly can for you. Well, not to worry. If they're listening to Fringe Radio, they're used to it by now. <laughs> <laughs> so remember, you know, Luke twenty six thirty one. Watch ye therefore, pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. So it's going to be glorious. Um, Jim, pray us out and we're going to have to go. We've only got a minute left. Okay. Father, we just come before you right now, Lord, and we just ask that you help all of us that are yours to take to keep a peaceful heart, to keep a close relationship with you, Lord. Help us to see that our our dependency, our faith is in you, not in events. Whether these events happen or whether they don't, if they should all happen at one time, if they don't happen at all, our faith should be unyielding on you, Lord. Help it to be that way, that our, our eyes are focused totally on you and not the surrounding circumstances, Lord, that whatever happens or doesn't happen, that you're still on the throne, that you don't make mistakes, you've never uh, been not in control, you're always in control, and help us really see that as a, 
a revelation. We just thank you for the show tonight, Lord. I thank you for every listener here, and I pray that you just burn this in their hearts, Lord. Make them a pillar of strength during whatever time and season they may have to go through any of this. Help us all to be a, a wellspring of, of life and water for others, whether they be fellow Christians or whether they be lost. Lead these to us, Lord, that we might be able to share this hope and joy that we have in you. We ask it in your mighty and precious name, Jesus. Amen. Amen and hallelujah. Stay tuned for Ali Mazuli. Um, God willing, we'll see you next week for another spiritual encounter. Good night. Good night.